Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. The United States are number one when it comes to many instances. For example, they were number one uh, this year at the Women's Soccer Championship. Very nice. But they're also number one in incarcerating their own people. Currently, there are over 2.2 million people incarcerated in prisons and jails throughout the country. And um, one of these prisons is San Quentin State Prison in the beautiful Bay of San Francisco. It was founded in 1852 in the Gold Rush area and currently hosts over 4,000 prisoners, which is quite a lot, so it's overpopulated by 140%. Back in the days, the reputation of San Quentin was quite uh, bad in the 60s and 70s. There was a lot of uh, violence going on in San Quentin. Nowadays, San Quentin State Prison is the place you actually want to be as a prisoner in California because there are 100 voluntary programs which you can run through, such as the Prison University Project. That's a project, if you're enrolled in that, you can get an Associate of Arts degree and you have on-site, it's not online, it's on-site education classes like maths, Spanish, English, chemistry, whatever it is. And Elena and I, we got engaged with this program by starting to teach German. And that was a phenomenal experience by itself. We also soon realized that these students would actually much more benefit by the principles of improv. So we successfully lobbied to teach improv as a class of the college education. And we called this class Improv for Life and eventually we built community behind bars. Well, how did this look like? So we had 17 students in our class and none of them dropped out which is a rarity. Um, we had two teachers, and Martin and I co-taught the class, and we invited guests like Rebecca Poretsky from BATS and Jakob Blass, the German filmmaker who's using improv to make movies. We met over the course of 12 weeks, and we met twice a week for two to three times each, and inspired by Diane Rachel's performance lab structure, we uh, included performance in our teaching. So we had a class uh, performance in the middle and a performance at the end of our class. The principles underlying our class were supporting each other, being generous, and celebrating risk. And um, as it is a college degree class, we had to grade our students. Now you might think, uh, grading and improv, how can those two get together? Uh, and yes, it was challenging at the beginning, but we found a way to combine playing games, speaking about the experiences playing the games, and also uh, debriefing how we can apply uh, our uh, takeaways uh, to the real world beyond the stage and reading and written assignments to make this class gradable. 12 weeks, 12 topics, ranging from spontaneity, vulnerability, status, and trust. Yes, trust was the more or less overlying or underlying theme for the entire class. And Kat Coppett in her book has this beautiful equation, trust equals credibility times intimacy divided by risk. Now risk, I mean, prisons are being regarded as high risk environments, and it is true. I mean, there are guard towers, there are correctional officers, there's a shooting range next to St. Quentin where they practice their rifles, there's a no hostage policy, so we could go on and on. Yet we soon realized whenever we taught in St. Quentin, we felt extremely safe as voluntary teachers. This doesn't apply for our students. So just a, uh, three words for our improvisers here in the audience is like circles of probabilities. When we here all hear the sound of squeaking sneakers on the floor, we would probably think, oh, maybe there's a basketball game going on. You know, it's a positive thing, you know. When they hear that sound, when our students hear that sound, they think trouble, they go into their fight or flight mode because someone is running and maybe there, someone is being, getting beat up or even worse, stabbed. So it's a completely different set of acoustics, perceptions of acoustics. And so we had to work on that quite a bit. On the other hand, we worked on credibility a lot in terms of just uh, building um, competence, doing the basic improv things, supporting each other, don't throw your partner under the bus, you know, just the basics, make each other look good. On the other hand, intimacy. There's a lot of people in this place, 140%. You would think that's pretty intimate, but most of them don't know each other. They self-segregate and aren't being segregated by race, so they don't know each other. So we played a, um, a very simple game at the beginning. It's something like, come over here. So it's like, come over here if you like pizza, okay? So then the people come over here who like pizza. They started this game by playing it and said, come over here if you are a lifer which means you're in prison for life, okay? That's 15 years. We didn't coach them to do that. They choose that to do them themselves. And then 80% of the class came over here. So we had a 
rough understanding because one other point, important point is we didn't look up their criminal records because that would compromise our teacher-student relationship. One of our students' favorite game was Scooby-Doo, and it works like this. So imagine you're uh, with a bunch of friends in an evening hour, it's getting dark, and you're in front of this abandoned amusement park, and of course you want to get in and explore this amazing place, right? But the only way to move or speak is by being directed by somebody else, and you can also direct others, only one direction at a time. So for example, Martin runs up to the gate and says, wow, this looks absolutely amazing. Wow, this looks absolutely amazing. Elena follows and says, I got the keys to this place. I got the keys to this place. Martin grabs the keys and says, yeah, jackpot. Yeah, jackpot. Well, okay, I think you get how it works, right? Normally, it's not nearly as flawless, and of course, we um, knew how to <laughs> what we were going to get with this. Uh, it's more about the struggle, like actually many improv games are, right? It's not about excelling at the game, it's about the struggle. And our students struggle just as much, or little, as everyone else playing this game does outside of a prison. So by playing Scooby-Doo, we actually were able to increase our students' awareness. Like, when are you leading? When are you following? Also, everyone is responsible for everybody, right? If you uh, make a direction like, Martin panics and screams, and nobody says, Martin, stop screaming, he's just going to keep on screaming, right? So you have to take care of each other. Martin, stop screaming. Okay. <laughs> um, and, you have to tr and, you, and it trains imagination. In order to explore this amazing place, you have to see it, so you have to make it visible, you have to make your partners see the space and explore it together. One topic we came back to back again it, during that class was status and so we played a lot of games status cards but also had written homework assignments like we said before to make it gradable and one of these was how do you experience status in your life and one of our students beautifully wrote in his assignment i guess being in prison with its various different segregated systems i experienced the extreme fluctuation of status every day all day i would have never thought uh, about how one's status changes in just one conversation, let alone throughout the day. When I wake up in the morning, I experience the status changes between me and my cellmate when we greet each other or not. So these people, they live together, these students, they live in cells five times eight feet, two of them, very confined spaces. There is a little toilet there, a little wash sink, so there is no privacy, okay? The student in this picture is not the student we're curr cur currently quoting. He then went on to say, this assignment has, first of all, ruined my TV watching experience. So if they can't afford it, they have a little television in their, in their cell. Instead of watching the two or three programs I like, I'm now watching for status changes. Thank you very much. But seriously, this assignment has me paying closer attention to my actions when engaging others. I have developed a newfound respect for gestures, looks, and body movements, and how they convey so much more than I thought. So as you can see, our, our class had quite some impact, and actually uh, much more than we are expected. So our students told us that, that taking this class, it helped them to like redefine failure, like pivoting from feeling a societal failure to like realizing like you can fail good-naturedly, and also uh, failure is part of the human experience. It also helped to break down racial boundaries. And um, uh, the best example for that is this. As Martin said, prison is a pretty racially segregated place, one of our students, who is white, invited his white friends to our last performance, and they asked him, how many white folks are in this class? And he said, well, I guess about 50%. Then he showed up to the performance and realized he was the only white guy in the whole class. It also fosters resilience. It's an arbitrary place, the prison, and um, having the skills to deal with that is just very valuable. Um, this quote by Mark Twain summarizes it beautifully, against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand, and you bet we laughed quite a lot in this class. But that wasn't it. Like, the impact went beyond uh, bars. And our students told us that their families noticed micro changes in their behavior. And so they were ab able to better reconnect with their families. It also equips them to rehabilitate, to get out eventually into this vastly changed world. And these programs cut recidivism. So if you want to find out more about our work at San Quentin News, go to the San Quentin News page and, uh, and read the article about it. Improv gave me a chance to practice everything I've learned in self-help groups. So that's a very strong statement to leverage, to use the leveraging power of improv. Just briefly wrapping up what comes next. A lot of things we want to repeat this class. We want to evaluate it. We had a lot of post-survey qualitative analysis. We want to quantify that and expand it to 
correctional officers, victims, eventually mixed classes along the lines of restorative justice. And we also want you all to take the lead at your local prison or jail because there are 2.2 million Americans or American residents incarcerated currently and throughout the world, even more people. So take a lead at your local prison. And go out, teach improv for life to build community behind bars and beyond. Thank you. Thank you.